Well, good morning, family. You're a part of that. You know what? You are a part of what's going on in Denmark. How cool is that? I mean, that's family. That's, that's the family we're a part of. Uh, I'm excited to see Mika and Fabian when they come back. I, I, we, we didn't cross paths, we just, but I've interacted with Mika when he was here a little while back, and I'm excited at what this church is able to be a part of as we minister with and to and through missionaries across the globe. Oh, before we begin this morning, would you stand with me? Turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 4. Psalm chapter 4. And as you're turning there, as you're, as you're opening your copy of God's Word this morning, I want to ask you a question. Where do you run when life gets hard? Where do you turn when situations are difficult? Where do you go when you're broken? Let's read together Psalm chapter 4. For the choir director on stringed instruments, a psalm of David. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress So be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O sons of men, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? Selah. But know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble. And do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. Many are saying, who will show us good? Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and new wine abound. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. This is the word of the Lord. Would you bow your heads and pray with me this morning as we ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, we come before you once again. Father, (laughs) We get to call you Father. Such undeserving sinners such as myself get to call you Father because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so we come to you this morning asking for a fresh glimpse at your involvement daily in our lives. God, would you increase and may I decrease. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Before I get in too far, I want to say a couple things by way of, uh, I suppose I'm saying sort of announcements. That's a terrible word, although actually here it's a funny word. A um, couple things by, just, just as like family business. Number one, let me thank each and every one of you for your prayers for my family, for my wife, and for my unborn son. You are a part of the miracle that God has and is continuing to do. The most recent update, so for those of you that are unfamiliar with our scenario, April 26th, my wife and I went into the doctor's office, all excited. Our kids were thrilled, dropped them off at school in the morning. We're going in. We're going to find the gender of our baby. And we leave after having been stopped and told, wait, we need to talk to you some more. Wait, hold on. Go see this specialist. We were told, essentially, that our, our, our little baby boy had zero chance of survival. No hope. 
And the prognosis was, wait, (laughs) just wait, wait and see. It's funny looking back to think that they almost couldn't have been more biblical in their advice to us. (laughs) They said, wait and see. So we waited five weeks later. Um, let Let me back up. The next day, we called on the elders to come and to pray with us and for us. And they did. And we trusted the Lord to do whatever He was going to do. We prayed with the heart of Job, Lord, You give, You take away. Blessed be Your name. Lord, preserve this life if it be Your will, but give us the strength to shine the light of Your gospel. Five weeks later, went back for the follow-up with the same Specialist, the, sur- the, the specialist, not a surgeon, There's no, there were no surgeons, there are no surgeons yet. The specialist said, after she finished doing her work with the ultrasound, pulls back, there's, her eyes got big, and she said, we are looking at a very different situation now. Amniotic fluid was gone, five weeks later, it had returned. Because of your prayers. I believe that with my whole heart because of your prayers. Maybe we should change his name, I don't know, to somehow put TBBF in there. I don't know. (laughs) I don't think I can get away with that one. And ever since, that was one pressure removed. So much so that she, she, my wife was able to get off of bed rest and, 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 and or be a little bit more active. We were able to go on the pastor's trip in June, and then we come back from the pastor's trip in June. She goes in for another follow-up, and there's a problem with the baby's heartbeat. Baby's heart rate keeps dropping. We might have to do emergency C-section. We might have to start evaluating whether or not you should just stay in the hospital from now until you give birth. Once again, we found ourselves on our knees before the Savior, as did you. And about three weeks ago, in the midst of a point where we were were saying goodbye to my wife because she was going to the hospital and we weren't going to see her on a regular basis for probably two months. But through the Lord's providence and by His grace, we, we went to a different hospital. <laughs> Saw a different specialist. And this specialist gave us hope. Not, not a kind of hope that, that just overwhelms and overcomes all obstacles or difficulties, but a hope that reminded me that God's still in control. And so, as of now, baby Jay is doing well. There's nothing to report other than the good news that the heartbeat is still continuing to go, baby is still growing, and my wife is still getting bigger. (laughs) The only time probably in my entire life that I can say that, say it from the pulpit, and be a good thing. (laughs) I had to do it. I'm sorry. I had to do it. In the midst of the last round of difficulties with this pregnancy, the Lord directed my heart and mind to Psalm chapter 4. In Psalm chapter 4, it tells us quite specifically the author is David. That's about the only easy thing about it. But before, before we jump into Psalm chapter 4, let me give you a little bit of the context, a little bit of the background, and let me ask you this as I, again, I don't know, I, I just gave you the most recent difficulty for my family and I, but I don't know what yours is right now. But, but it, I, I've heard it said that if you're not in the midst of some sort of trial, then you're either just coming out of one or you're about to go into one. It, it's, it's the commonality every human shares. The pain, the sorrow, the difficulty of 
various aspects of life. So I don't know about you right now, this morning. I don't know where you are. Maybe you're dealing with slander in the office, people bad-mouthing you to your boss or to one another. Maybe, maybe it's in your family you're dealing with slander. Maybe, maybe you're dealing with illness, or even as we saw yesterday, you're dealing with death of a loved one. Maybe you're dealing with some serious financial difficulties or financial losses. Maybe you are in the midst of some sort of serious relational tension. Maybe there's been some devastating family news like we've had. Can I implore you? Can I bring you along? Can I invite you to pray like the psalmist here in Psalm chapter 4? So let me give you briefly the context. Psalm chapter 3 and Psalm chapter 4 are often referred to as twin psalms. Psalm chapter 3 being a morning prayer. So, so before I get too far, I, this is maybe, maybe there's a little bit of conviction right now. What did you do this morning when you woke up? How did you start your day? Did you start your day with the pressures and the stresses and the trials of all those things or whichever thing it is that is burdening your heart and mind? Or were you able to say at the end of Psalm chapter 3, salvation belongs to the Lord and your blessing be upon your people? Or maybe you needed to say, as it says in verse 7 of chapter 3, Arise, O Lord, and save me, for you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek and shattered the teeth of the wicked. Maybe, maybe you this morning didn't. I don't want you to feel guilty, but I want you to say, I think you might have missed something. You might have missed an opportunity to commune with the Lord this morning. But don't worry, you have the rest of the day. And Psalm chapter 4 Many commentators believe this is an evening psalm. In fact, if you have uh, a NASB as I do, if you have the MacArthur Study Bible, it's probably in others, it says, evening prayer of trust in God at the top. That's not in the Hebrew, but it's kind of the title of the psalm. You have an opportunity even this evening to wrap up your day this way. And might I already right now encourage and challenge you? I know I'm jumping to the application before I even get into it. But as you lay your head on your pillow tonight, would you pray? Would you take your burdens and exchange them for Jesus? Come to me, all you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is easy. So let me give you the context here in in chapters 3 and 4. We know chapter 3 that this is a psalm of David because it says, and then second of all, it's when he fled from his son Absalom. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with the story of David and Absalom, but it takes place in 2 Samuel chapters 13 through 19, and you want to talk about a dysfunctional family, just go read those chapters for yourself. So let me quickly kind of wrap up some of these things. In chapter 13 of 2 Samuel, David's David's daughter Tamar is violated by his son Amnon, and his other son Absalom eventually kills him, then flees. That's a crazy chapter right there. You think your troubles are real? You think they're bad? Chapter 14, one of David's advisors, Joab, brings Absalom back, and for two years, David, <laughs> you'd think, you know, David, he's going to reconcile. No, for two years, David doesn't say a single word to his son Absalom. Not a single word. During which time, Absalom begins to plot to take, it, take over the throne. In chapter 15, that's exactly what happened. David flees. His, some, many of his advisors betray him, and he is forced into exile once again. Then in chapter 16, David is specifically on his flight from Jerusalem. He's ridiculed by some of Saul's descendants and ultimately his concubines are violated. He is also physically attacked. That's 
the background for Psalm 3 when he says this. Let me just read this for you quickly. Oh, Lord, how my adversaries have increased. (laughs) Yeah, sudden drastic increase of adversaries because shortly after this time, even when he's headed back, guess what? The, the nation of Israel that was kind of splintered off, that wasn't really close, they came back and they're like, wait, no, there's another betrayer who's like, let's lead the ten tribes against Judah and Benjamin. Lots of people are against him. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the one with, who lifts my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and He answered me from His holy mountain. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for You have smitten all my enemies on the cheek, shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon Your people." That's, that's what he wrote while he's running from Absalom. Can you imagine? I mean, David, at this point, he's fleeing from the son that he basically ignored for two years, that he basically almost pushed into responding to because he didn't deal properly with the sin between his daughter and his other son. And he, this is by extension... From when he sinned with Bathsheba. So, so it's not only the family difficulty, I, I, I truly believe David here in the midst of this knows how clearly oh, this is my fault. These are consequences I deserve. Which brings us to chapter 4. Now, now there's a dispute, or not, there's, there's, there's two possible explanations that, uh, that most agree. Either Psalm chapter 4 is a continuation, it's another psalm that is written during the time where David is fleeing from Absalom, or some would say that it was actually written while David was fleeing from Saul. While he was out in the caves having fled from Saul back in 1 Samuel. In either case, either situation, either circumstance, David is exiled. There's nothing familiar to him. There's a few select people around him, but he's out. He's gone. So now, Psalm 4. For the choir director on stringed instruments, a psalm of David. Uh, in, in the Hebrew text, that's, that's actually part of the Hebrew text. That's not just a, somebody wrote the pre- preface to this to say, hey, I want to throw something in there. No, this was intended to be sung. And I think there's something to be said here about even what we're doing right now. And even what we did 10, 15, 20 minutes ago. There's something to be said here about corporate lament. Together. Worshiping. Being in one place together and singing to the Lord. That's, that's what the church is. That's, that's what families are. They're together, right? They share, they do, uh, it's a modern phrase, they do life together. So let me, let me implore those of you briefly that are listening, come back and fellowship. Be a part of the body. Hug the family members around you. See the physical expression of Christ's body and experience His love through the fellowship of the church. Come back. And for those of you that are here, This is where we show and experience the love of Christ. So so don't, don't, don't just run off. Don't check your box and disappear. 
Please, come. Share your burdens. Even as Paul said, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's what we do. That's what what we're meant for. There's something to be said even about singing together in this way. And by the way, let me just pause for a second. Just because you don't have the voice of Diane Brown doesn't mean you shouldn't sing. There is nothing in Scripture that says you must have a trained voice. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Scripture says make... What was that word? Noise. Ain't nothing pretty about that. But there's something very real about it. It's an outpouring, as ugly as it might sound to the person next to you. There's an outpouring of the joy that you have for the one that made you and the one that saved you. So sing. Even if you can't carry a tune in a dump truck, sing. Praise the Lord together with this body. And when the person next to you is off, don't elbow them. (laughs) Don't silence them. Put your armor on them and sing louder. (laughs) And now we come to the cry here in verse number one, chapter four. Answer me when I call. Can you imagine talking to God this way? Now, some, some translations made this hear me when I call, but the, the, but the word is not just hear me. No, no, no. It's like, hey, I wanted a response here. I'm expecting something. Answer me when I call. Not just listen to me. No, no, no. I want, I want you to do something about this. Respond to me when I call. How in the world can the psalmist say this right now? Well, first of all, that, that tells us several things about the nature of this cry. What do we see? Answer me. There's a boldness. There's passion. There's a genuine, emotional, not just intellectual outpouring here. It, it's as if the psalmist is so broken, so hurting, that he's just on his face grabbing the feet of the Savior, pleading, answer me. Answer me when I call. It's also very personal. Answer me when I call. So, What's unwritten there is also that this is the first person he's turning to. This isn't after I told my, my best buddy, my girlfriends, my neighbor, you know, my, my confidant, my wife, my husband, my children, that coworker that I tell everything to. No, no, no. This is first. Answer me when I call. There, it is it's, it's almost assumed that the psalmist is immediately bringing this, coming before the Savior. It's passionate. It's personal. But it's also proper. He says this, O God of my righteousness. It's to Elohim, the God of creation, the sovereign Lord over all things. And it's His righteousness that he pleads. Some would say it this way, it could be translated as, O God, who maintains my right. The one, essentially, who vindicates me. Now, the psalmist didn't have this in, when he wrote this, but you and I, in the New Testament age, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can plead this even more. You are the one who has made me right. You can come before the throne of the Father, of the Creator, of the God of the universe. Why? Not because you're good enough, but because Jesus 
forgives sinners. And he draws you into his family. So we see, first of all, that he's, he's deity. He's God. He's the creator of all things. He's righteous. But he's also gracious. He says this, you have relieved me in my distress. Those words picture being stuck in a tight place. Some would say like an army backed up into a corner. You ever been stuck in a tight place? See, I, I have a theory that everybody is claustrophobic. Everybody. I, can't, I have yet to meet a person that's like, no, no, you want to like squish me between two gigantic pieces of rock? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> oh, hey, there's a tiny crawl space that my shoulders barely fit through? Yes! I don't know anybody like that. <laughs> I know nobody like that. And yet, David clearly, whether physically because he's fleeing and he's backed into a corner, even maybe, this is where maybe it may have been Saul. He's, he's tucked in the back of a cave and Saul's chasing after him. I mean, he's literally stuck. Maybe that's in mind as he's writing this. You have relieved me. It's, it's the idea of to make wide. So in the middle of that squeezing of whatever is happening, the Lord has given you a wideness, an openness, a freedom, a relief. Take a deep breath. Just like that. If you, in your mind, if some of you are like really claustrophobic and you were just thinking about it, you're just like, <laughs> and you take a deep breath, <sighs> yeah, like that. You have relieved me. You have made wide so that in the middle of it, notice it doesn't say that he's, he's now free from it. It's in it, in the middle of it. Because I can turn back to the one who created all things, who is righteous and who is great. He is gracious. And now guess what? Because of those past things, he says, be gracious to me and hear my prayer. You see, he, he knows God is his vindicator. And he knows that the only reason, the only reason he can come before him is because God is gracious and he begs him to hear his prayer. So there's the cry, verse number two. Oh, sons of men, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? Here we have conflict. Here's the conflict. It's, it's as if David has turned his eyes from the Lord, and now he's turning to speak to the people around him or to, to, to talk to those that are causing these troubles. And he says, oh, sons of men. This is kind of a uh, either an indication of a group that's kind of prominent, maybe people of, of some sort of position. Maybe it was men that just were proud and thought of themselves as people of prominence. But are they really people of prominence? Because he says this, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worth it? How long will you... I like, I like the way the New Living Translation says this. How long will you people try to ruin my reputation? How long are you going to try to destroy what God has given? Now, David's king. By God's appointment. Right? Yes. This wasn't pride on David's part. This wasn't David saying, look at me, I'm big stuff, I'm the king, kiss my shoes. No. He's reflecting still back on the God who is the vindicator. He's the one that put me in this place. So how long are you going to try to ruin this? How long are you going to kick against what God wants? Not only that, we see their motivations, right? The men who love what is worthless, and they pursue lies. They aim at deception. You know, before, before just moving on from this, it is, let me pause, take a time out, and ask you to stop what you and I naturally do right here. Okay, maybe it's just me. I'll tell you what. I'll be honest. I stop and I think, oh, I know that's exactly what my children deal with. They pursue empty. Oh, you know these teens? They are pursuing empty, vain things. They listen to lies. Those, those people out there, 
They are, no, they're the ones that pursue lies. Well, yes, of course they do. Are they the ones that love what is worthless? Yes, they do. But aren't we as well? Don't we so quickly forget eternity and cast aside the feast of heaven for the table scraps of the world? Don't we so easily get wrapped up in political conversations, in financial conversations, in personal conversations, to the neglect of the eternal ones, to the neglect of the gospel conversations. You don't have to raise your hand. I am. I'm guilty. Often. How long will you love what is worthless? How long will you aim at deception? So before you think about those out there, I, I, think, it's a, I think it's an important and a, a, a very powerful preface into, what, into the next contemplation. Some would say David is continuing to talk outward, and perhaps very likely he is. In verse number three, but I think in verse number three, he turns a little bit more inward. In verse number three, we see the contemplation. Verses three, I think I wrote the verses down on the notes, so forgive me. Verses three through five, we have the contemplation. He says this, but know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. Know it. Do you know it? Do you know it? There is an absolute confidence. No, there's no doubt. There's no hesitation. No question. And also, I think it's very important here that David uses the covenant name of God. But know that Yahweh, the covenant-making, personal covenant-keeping God, is the one that sets apart the godly man. Other tra- another way to translate set apart is to deal wonderfully with the godly man. And who has he set him apart for? Himself. Not so you can be stuck on a pedestal, not so people can look at you and go, oh, oh, such a spiritual paragon. Let me bask in the wake of your glory. I mean, maybe bask in the reflection of your bald head or something, but I see you. But no, because God, Yahweh, has set apart the godly man for himself. God is both the one who does it and the reason for it. And you can be absolutely confident in that. So let me ask again, are you confident? Are you, like it says in Ephesians 4, are you certain that God has chosen you from before the foundation of the world? Are you holy and blameless before Him? Not because you are, but because of what Jesus Christ has done and you are a recipient of the grace by faith in Christ that is salvation. Do you have good works prepared to walk before by God? Ephesians 2. If God is for you, then who can be against you? Romans 8. Know this. So therefore, the psalmist responds that the Lord hears when I call to him. Yahweh hears when I call. If you are a child of his, you can be absolutely confident that when you say the word Father, 
you are immediately transported before Him and immediately communing with Him. You can know absolute, solid confidence in the covenant-keeping God. But then, he says in verse 4, tremble and do not sin. There's actually a little bit of back and forth. This, this word for tremble in, in the in ASB is actually translated in the ESV and the New Living Translation as be angry. But you got to be honest here, in this one, I actually really like the King James. It says to stand in awe. You know, you, know that, you know that moment where you, you're, like, you're just trembling because of something either, something is just so unbelievably awesome or so miraculous nearly that you're just trembling because of that, usually in a sense of fear? I wasn't here for the earthquake, so I can't use that as an, an illustration, but I have been through a typhoon. Sustained wind speeds of over 150 miles an hour for more than two hours. Trees and rain going this direction. It's probably similar to your experience with the earthquake. Except the word earthquake is literally trembling. That's the same idea. That's the word the psalmist used here when he says to be tremble. And in the context of what he's talking about, he says, then do not sin. So what are we trembling about? What are we trembling at? We're trembling at the one who has set the godly man apart for himself. We're trembling at the one who is just, the one who is the judge. Now, it's interesting because most of what happens in the world today, and even in, let's be honest, our own hearts, is we switch those two things around. Instead of saying tremble and do not sin, we say sin and do not tremble. You be you. Be authentic. Be true to yourself. And as much as we cringe immediately in this context, don't we actually sort of buy that? Don't we sort of buy it in our own hearts? Yeah, I deserve that. No, you know, I, I deserve a break now. That's just, it's no big deal. No, tremble, stand in awe, and do not sin. That should be the response of our heart. And not only that, but then meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. I think most of you, the only word you heard was bed. Some of you are now awake. No, meditate in your heart. It is literally saying, speak to your heart. Do you talk to yourself? Some of you are doing it right now. Yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> you were just told to talk to yourself. Do you realize that? I know some people think it's a sign of insanity, but it's actually, if it's done in the right way for the right reason, with the proper meditation and the proper words, it is exactly what the Holy Spirit causes you to do. You speak to your heart. Sound familiar? Ephesians chapter 5. Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. We're actually commanded to do that. Do you do that? Right before you go to bed? Are you, are, 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 is your mind reeling from the stuff of the day? The argument you had with your spouse? The fight you had with your children? The difficulty you're having at work? All those things that at the very beginning we talked about? Are, are all those pressures what's right, winding through your head? Or are you speaking to your heart truth about who God is? about what He's done, about the mercies that He's shown you in your life, and about the realities that He's promised in the future. Are you speaking to your heart? Yes, in your bed. But it doesn't have to be isolated there. 
No, you don't have to wait till you go home and start speaking truth to your heart. No, you don't have to wait till you get into your bed to wait to speak to your heart. Meditate, speak truth to your heart in stillness. Be still and know that He is God. Do you notice, by the way, that what the only thing that brings David and the only thing really that should bring us true hope, true relief from our distress is the knowledge of the Holy One, who God is. Because we all know that we all let people down, don't we? Maybe it's just me. No, we all know. We've been let down by people, and we let down people. David finds no hope and no source of true strength, and we're going to see here in just a minute, no joy in anything other than who God is. Maybe you're right in the middle right now of something you're like, I don't see any way out of it. There's no daylight. Turn to Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And guess what's going to happen? The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. You can bank on it that when you put your eyes upon Him, the cares of this world fade. That's what David knew. That's what he's saying. Not only that, should we speak to ourselves truth? Verse 5, he says, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. These offer, literally, offer righteous sacrifices. David, maybe in this context, maybe he was referring to Absalom's false sacrifices. Or, or maybe he's simply recalling the worship in the temple where they had two kinds of sacrifices. He said two group, cat, basic categories. One for sin and one for worship. Either way, he's reminding us to take our thoughts and our worship to the one who is trustworthy. Trust in the Lord. Say, but you don't know what I'm walking through. You have no idea what that person said about me. You have no idea how horrible my boss is. You have no idea how terrible my parents are. Sorry, that's the youth pastor in me coming out. Most of you are like, parents? What are you talking about? No, I, yeah, I deal with the youth. You have no idea the trouble with my wayward child. And you're right, I don't. But God does, and He is trustworthy. Romans 12. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, completely, without reservation, which is your reasonable, your logical, your What else could you possibly do in response to what Christ has done for you? Act of worship. Then we see a contrast in verses 6 and 7. We see contrast in verses 6 and 7. He says this, Many are saying, who will show us any good? Um, Now, maybe here, Paul, uh, maybe, excuse me, (laughs) Paul, maybe David here is saying, to the people around us. Maybe he's listening to the people because it says, many are saying who will show us. So there's this collectiveness about, maybe it's even people in the, that right here around you. Maybe, man, who's going to show us good? Who's going to do good for us? In, in David's context, if this was when he was fleeing from Saul, maybe it was the, the mighty men that were around him that were, that were finally reaching their breaking point. They're just like, what are we going to do? This is hopeless. Who, who are we going to find to give us any kind of good? Or maybe it is during his flee from Absalom when he's wandering out and Saul's, Saul's, um, Saul's relative is hurling both insult and rocks at him. And now he's wandering off to a location, crossing the Jordan River, going outside the boundaries of his kingdom to who knows where. 
And the people that are following him are murmuring, man, what is this guy doing? How are we going to do, like, how are we going to get this? How are we getting through this? David, did you have a plan? I mean, come on, plan. Right? If you don't, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Come on, David, what's wrong with you? Where's the plan? Who's going to do good? Where does David turn? Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. It's as if he turns to, directly to Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you and make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. He turns their thoughts. Maybe He says it to them. Maybe, maybe it was, He's recalling something that He reminded them of Scripture. Turn with me back to the Lord. Remember what the Lord in His grace has done for us. And then in verse, chap- in verse number 7, sorry, we saw, we saw His value. We see what He's putting value on. It's not the circumstances. It's not what's around Him. It's the one who has made Him. And once again, by the way, in that verse, He uses again the covenant name of God. Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, Yahweh. And in verse 7, there's a source of gladness. He says, you have put gladness in my heart. Um, You'll notice this, this is a very unique way to say this, isn't it? Think about when you're happy. What makes you happy? What happens when you try to manufacture that happiness? You try to make it happen. It lasts for like a millisecond, right? It's like, yeah. Woo. It's almost as if you're, you're, you're getting on that roller coaster for the first time and you, everybody tells you it's awesome and then suddenly you're at the top and you're going downhill like, ah! But here, the psalmist is very clear. You, God, you, Yahweh, You have put the gladness into my heart. You've done this. In fact, so much so that it's even more than when their grain and new wine abound. Grain and new wine is prosperity. And this isn't us, this is them, this is their, this is other people, possibly his enemies. The contrast. You have put gladness in my heart that is even greater than the people who are successful according to the world's standards. You know those people that seem like they got it all? We live pretty close to a lot of them. You, Yahweh, have put gladness in my heart that's greater than. It is bigger than is more powerful than, it is more permanent than the circumstances of physical success. Uh, I'm reminded of a couple things. In Isaiah chapter 9, he says this, he says, he's glad in your presence as with the gladness of harvest as men rejoice when they divide spoil. Paul on Mars Hill, as he's talking about the unknown God in Acts 14, says something, something similar. He says, to satis- the one that satisfies your heart with food and gladness. See, see what, what even those that are not in the family understand, but they don't understand, they don't tend to understand, that even their success is only because of the graciousness of God. The general grace and mercy of God. Because even the sun shining and the rain falling is because of Him. It's all because of Him. Does does that change your perspective? Just a little? And whatever it is you're walking through or about to walk through? Because it definitely did for David because we come to verse number 8 and we see the comfort. In peace, shalom, I will both lie down and sleep for you alone. 
make me to dwell in safety. Do you sleep well at night? Now, some of you, there may be a physiological reason. Don't feel like you're unspiritual if you can't sleep. But if you're waking up in the middle of the night because of anxiety, because you're carrying worry, because you're fretting over those things, cast your care upon Him because He cares for you. And then when you focus your attention on Him, you will be able to say just like the psalmist. Imagine this. I mean, David, his son who killed his other son, who raped his daughter because he did nothing about it, has fled his own kingdom and is now out sleeping on the rocks. And he says, I will both lay me down and sleep in peace. Why? How? How on earth can he say that? Are you kidding me? You think you got a wayward kid? Did your kid murder somebody else? Kick you out of your own house? Why? Because you alone, Yahweh, you alone, Lord, make me to dwell in safety. You see, God Himself makes places, puts, directs, guides, brings all of these things, partially so that we will simply turn to Him and to Him alone, because He alone is the one that can make us to dwell in safety. I mean, th- th- there's, a, there's a picture here, to dwell in safety. T- to dwell is to stay, to sit, to inhabit, to move in. But yeah, I've been kicked out of my house, but, but God, I'm, I'm safe and secure in yours. Even if the roof over my head is nothing but the stars. Can you say that? Proverbs 3, when you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden fear and of the onslaught of the wicked when it comes, for Yahweh will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. John chapter 14, Jesus himself says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not not as the world gives do I give to you. I don't give you peace like the world gives claims peace, some sort of emptying of your mind, trying to forget things or drown them in some sort of substance. No, I give you a peace that is lasting, so don't let your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. In Romans 14, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Let me close this evening by sharing a brief story. Nicholas Ridley was a bishop in Reformation, uh, pre-Reformation England. Nicholas Ridley was a, was a bishop during the time where there was a conflict in the throne. Either Mary was going to take the throne or her cousin was going to be taking the throne. And Ridley threw his lot in with the cousin who was not called Bloody Mary. That's the other option. She wasn't called Bloody Mary at the time, so it's okay. But he says this, basically after Mary captured all of the people that were trying to put Jane Grey into the throne, he was captured, thrown in prison, immediately condemned to die. And on the night preceding the execution of the Bishop of London, his brother offered to pass his last hours in his company. But the bishop refused, saying that he meant to go to bed and sleep as quietly as he ever did in his life. Facing execution the next morning, a family member says, hey, I'll come stay with you. 
He's like, why? I'm going to sleep. I'm going to go to bed. But, I mean, you can come, I guess. Probably not a very comfortable place to come and stay, but I'm going to sleep. Can you imagine that? Your execution's tomorrow. You sleeping tonight? And sure enough, the next morning, he was chained to the stake in the town ditch opposite the front of Balliol College in Oxford. And as the flames around him rose, he exclaimed with a loud voice, Lord, receive my spirit. He slept. He lay down and slept in peace. Why? Because he was excited for the burning at the stake? Because his circumstances caused him to be joyful? Because he knew the one who is the keeper of his soul. So this morning, I don't know where you are. I don't know what, what's going on in your life. I can't. But I know the one who does. Some of you this morning might not know the one who does. You might not have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But can I tell you that today is the day of salvation? Today, you can join the family, and not just the bridge family. I mean, I mean the family of God. And you can have this kind of confidence so that when trials come, because Jesus promised they will come, you can say, I will lay me down and sleep in peace because you alone make me dwell in safety. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for the truth and the reality of your word, the power that is the knowledge of the Holy One. And Lord, I, I think of my little boy and the power that you've demonstrated. And, and Lord, the reality hits me that even if you had taken him, my hope is not in circumstances. It's in you and you alone. Because you are good. And as Job said, you give and you take away. So bless your name. Father, today I don't know where the hearts of your people are at the Bridge Bible Fellowship, but may they turn to you. May they pray. May they cry out to you. May they see your comfort. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.